Special thanks to the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving for supporting tonight's conversation. Now, when Connecticut Public started talking with Connecticut Black and Brown Student Union, I believe it was last summer, Shanika Farias was organizing, was organizing director of CTBBSU, or Connecticut BBSU. And since that time, she has now been named executive director of Connecticut BBSU. <laughs> And Shanika will be moderating tonight's conversation. So again, I wanted to applaud her for her leadership as well as the impactful work that Connecticut Black and Brown Student Union does statewide. Before Shine begins the conversation with our panelists, I'd like to welcome Annie Stockton to share remarks around the topic of food security. Annie is Vice President of the Gemma E. Moran United Way Labor Food Center in New London. Annie Stockton. Thank you, Lucy. Good evening, everyone. Um, it is so nice to be here. I'm really, I'm honored to be standing here. I'm honored to be on this stage and to be able to open this event up. Um, so I am the vice president of the Gemma E. Moran United Way Labor Food Center, which is, it's a lot of words. Um, we are essentially a food bank. So we are um, a program of the United Way of Southeastern Connecticut. And it's such a special place. I just have to, I have to tell you a little bit about our food center uh, because it's very, or it's not common at all for a United Way to own and operate its own food bank. I actually believe that we may be the only United Way in the world that owns and operates a food bank. And we are located in um, New London County and it's such a wonderful community. Um, so it's a privilege for me to be the vice president there. Um, it's a privilege for our community that we have our own local food bank in our own county. And um, it's named after Gemma Moran, who is our founder and um, she had a dream. So her whole life, Gemma Moran, she just passed away this year. She was 99 years old. And she really had a vision. She said, I want to do something because I don't ever want to see a child go to school hungry. So with her determination and a little bit of funding from United Way, in 1988, she opened up this small food center. And now our food center, 35 years later, we just had a birthday. Um, we are serving 72 different feeding programs in New London County, and we are distributing 1.8 million pounds of food out to our community every year. So I always, that's always important to me when I think about what one person can do, and I always think what one, not just one person, but one woman could do with some determination and some support, she was able to start this food bank in New London County. So we serve, like I said, we serve 72 programs in the county. Um, and our focus is really, when you think about, you know, we talk about she didn't want to see any child hungry. And we really think about what is hunger versus what is food insecurity. So really, you know, being hungry is that feeling, right? Like your stomach is making noises and your you're physically your body is hungry. But food insecurity is really that notion of, it, it might not be today or tomorrow, but you're thinking where am I going to get my meal at the end of the week, right? Like I may have enough money or enough food for this week, but what's going to happen next week? So along with that food insecurity comes nervousness and anxiety and anxiousness and worry. So it's, so it's really just that feeling of not knowing where, maybe not the next meal, but you know, four meals from now or five meals from now, where is that going to come from? Um, so, and I think in today's day and age, I believe you have the Alice report on your tables. So um, United Ways, United Ways across the country have this Alice report where we look at um, what does it actually cost to live? Not what's the poverty rate, but what does it cost to live? And in Connecticut, a family of four needs to make over $45 an hour just to be able to, to make ends meet. So when we think about that the minimum wage is $15.69 an hour, but a family of four needs over $45 an hour just to make ends meet, it's no wonder that we're experiencing such high rates of food insecurity in our community. And, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to solve or end food insecurity. Um, so what we did as a food bank recently was we engage, we, you know, we want to say, like, what does this look like in real life? What does that mean? So we had conversations with our 72 members to learn more about what are you actually seeing day to day in this world? And what we're hearing, I don't think it's uncommon across the whole state, we're seeing a 20% increase in the number of people that are coming to food pantries. We're seeing mostly families. I believe it's about 69% families that are coming to access food. I had someone that runs um, a community kitchen or a soup kitchen in the community say to me the other day, Annie, 
I have to I have to stock diapers at the at the soup kitchen. That wasn't something we had to do a couple years ago because it was mostly single folks or adults coming into our soup kitchen. And now we have to make sure we have diapers on hand because we're seeing families come here every night. So we're just seeing these increases. Um, people are coming. There, we're now starting to open pantries on the weekends and at night because we have so many folks that are coming straight from work to come get food in food pantries. So I think what people say like the face of need, it's just changing. It's just changing abruptly, it's changing quickly. Um, and I think as a food bank, it's our job to, to make sure that we're changing along with that change. So I'll, I'll wrap up by just saying that um, there's an expression I've heard and there's an expression I've used. And that expression is, when you have no food, all food is good food. And I do believe that to some extent, but I also think that we owe it to the people who, who need food, that we have to think beyond that. We have to think beyond the idea that all food is good food when you have no food. We have to think about things like, what kind of food do people want to eat, right? What is culturally appropriate? What are people asking for, right? We have to think about where do people feel comfortable? An important one for me is, um, you know, it's not just where can we get the most amount of food to the most number of people, but it's about where do people feel safe getting food or where do people feel comfortable asking for help. So I think along with just making sure they have access to food, we want to make sure it's healthy food, we want to make sure it's good food, um, and we want to make sure that people feel really safe and really comfortable wherever they're going to access that food. Because at the end of the day, I mean, I think about, you know, we're enjoying a spread right now. Like food is love, right? Food brings us together. Food is more than just nutrition for our bodies, but it's like it's nourishing our souls. And I think that in all that we do, we have to remember that food is so much more than just like calories that we're putting into our body. So um, again, I thank you for letting me open this conversation up and for being here today. And I am happy to turn it over to Shanaiko, who's going to moderate the conversation. Hello. There we go. Y'all look lovely tonight. Hello. Good evening. Y'all look quiet. Was the food that good? Got you a little sleepy? Maybe? All right. Well, we're going to get a little energetic tonight because we have the opportunity to have some lovely people here on stage with us to have this conversation on food security. And all of you here tonight, I'm sure there's a lot more to say. There's a lot more you're thinking. And you all have your personal stories and your personal reasons why you're with us tonight and why this conversation is important to you. So like Lucy said and Annie says, I'm Shanika Farias, the executive director of the Connecticut Black and Brown Student Union. And we are happy to be in this partnership, um, to be here tonight, to, have, to be able to host these conversations that are so important to our community. But we are not here to hear from me. We're here to hear from these amazing people who are here on stage with us tonight. First, we have Lauren Little. <laughs> Lauren is an urban farmer, educator, and activist. And in her work as an urban fa farmer, she managed 60 school farms plots, taught over 6,000 students how to grow food, and fed more than 100 families throughout the greater Hartford area. From 2020 to 2023, in partnership with Mutual Aid Hartford and Kenny Park Sustainable Project, Lauren distributed more than 200 pounds of free and fresh produce to residents and students. And in 2024, she was named Environment Educa Environmental Educator of the Year by Connecticut Outdoor and Environmental Education. Ladies and gentlemen, Lauren Little. And next we have Dr. Christine Caruso. She is the assistant professor of the Practice College of the Environmental and Public Health and Environmental Psychologist with expertise in food and social determinant of health. Her area of specialization explores food systems, 
specifically in urban set centers and how equity and environmental justice factors play a role in health outcomes. Dr. Caruso research explored the factor of influences that shape um, school food and meal service and the associated impact on both students and school food workers. Her most current project continued to examine institutional food as well as health disparity, care, labor, and civic engagement. Christine Caruso. Next, we have our amazing Jocelyn Serda. <laughs> Mercado's popular founder, Jocelyn Serda, is a long life mem member of the Hartford community whose personal journey led to her ways to help others connect and share their knowledge on health and nutrition. After being diagnosed with Crohn's disease, she began looking for work that gave her the community and improved the quality of life. She began working for Area Market beginning in 2016 as an intern. Jocelyn found her passion for creating healthier and more equi equitable society. She co-created additional neighborhood farmers market, including one, of, one in Springfield, Massachusetts, and Hartford winter markets during COVID-19. She knows how good food and plants heal our body, and she wants others to have access to quality nutrition. Ladies and gentlemen, Jocelyn Serda. Last but not least, we have our amazing Emmanuel, Elijah Elonde, Eladun. <laughs> um, Nelson was born in LA and an artist, herbalist, and a farmer for five to six years. His focus is on herbs and produce that helps to heal respiratory and blood system. And his mother is his inspiration. She is the one that planted the seed, the seed when he was young, he would help his mom weed the garden and pick berries in front in the front yard. Also do for self and was drilled in his life and his head along the way of how to eat, to live and be carried on his life when he get older. After his mother passed from cancer, he started searching for her and found a bunch of herbal books, which he studied at the age of 16 to start this journey. And Emmanuel is also a living artist and he's a fashion designer, musician and a painter. Ladies and gentlemen, Emmanuel. So to begin our conversation tonight, the first question we have is what brings you to this work? How has this issue of food security personally affected you? And what emotions and experiences have you encountered in your journey to address this issue? So we'll start with what brings you to this work? And then we can start with Dr. Cruz. Hello. Um, I think what brings me to this work is the love of food more than anything and how fundamental food is to understanding our everyday life and the ways in which the social justice issues of our times and sort of all elements from education to housing to everything else show up in the way in which we access food. And so to me, it's a lens into all of these issues and exploring the ways in which we can fight for social justice through addressing the challenges in the food system. And it's a fundamental component that impacts all of our lives. Um, I would say the reason why I do this work is it's something that my students has asked for. I remember kind of being in the school and learning about child psychology and how the brain develops in a certain way and they need a really dense um, nutrients and able to properly grow. And I just remember seeing my students just not feeling good or looking good and seeing the food that they were eating and really not feeling it and wanting that to be different. And when I see the effects of how lack of nutrition uh, influenced my students, I just didn't like that. I just didn't like how that felt. Um, and also, I really took time to listen to them and figure out what do you want to learn, what do you need, and really take an opportunity to uplift their voice. And so I definitely agree with everything Dr. Caruso said. I also um, was influenced because my students want to see that, specifically the ones that are in Hartford. And since I love them and I also love food, I wanted to really make that a reality so when they get my age, it won't be something that would be such a struggle for them. Hello, is this on? Okay. Uh, so what brought me into this work? Um, 
it started with my childhood. Um, whether I do it or not at that time, uh, my family really struggled with food security. Um, and I quickly realized that uh, I wasn't the only one that struggled with food security. Um, I relied heavily on uh, school breakfast and school lunch. Um, and if I didn't eat breakfast or lunch, um, I wasn't sure if I was gonna eat uh, at all that day. Um, and as you know, I progressed, um, I quickly learned that healthful foods were the difference. I used to go to corner stores, grab some ch uh, chips, bright blue juices, now and laters, and that's what I would eat. Um, and with my work at the farmer's markets, I quickly learned that when I eat fresher produce, I feel better, um, I'm able to function better, um, and my quality of life improves. So I want to be able to share that knowledge and access with other people who grew up where I grew up. Hello, all right, yeah, all right. Um, so yeah, what brought me into this work, um, yeah, like what's said in my bio is my mother. Um, when I was younger, I grew up eating, uh, I grew up as a vegetarian, um, eating berries from the yard and eating um, uh, blueberries, like uh, actually growing these plants and actually seeing how they grow. So after actually growing up and going through the school system and actually eating the school food, and actually seeing my brothers and my sisters uh, having health problems. Um, and after uh, my mother's passing and uh, figuring out that I could actually heal her through these books that she left behind for me, um, after that happened, uh, it angered me to a certain degree. So after this, finding myself in these books and actually trying to search for um, something to heal us and help us to become better. So this is why I got into this work. Um, it, just, uh, just to try to actually learn more about myself and to help uh, teach kids about themselves and uh, how to utilize the plants that's around them to actually heal and uh, teach the kids around them uh, so that it's actually like a community and that's um, and that is culture you know so yeah that that's that's the reason why I'm here thank you so this is a conversation for a lot of us as we, knowing each and every single one of you and the personal work that you do. I'm just curious, do you notice the connection between fighting for racial justice and working toward food and environmental justice? Anyone can start. Can you run the question back, please? Do you notice the connection between fighting for racial justice and working towards food and environmental justice? I can respond to that. Um, so my company, Lauren Little Edutainment, really focuses on helping people develop a personal, personal relationship with nature so we can begin to address some of those um, racial inequalities, specifically white supremacy and anti-blackness. And what I see is the difference in the quality of the food that students get and noticing that some of the black and brown students don't have good, as good food. It's not as nutrient dense, it's not local. And so me kind of tracing back why that is, I've come to learn that Hartford is, is not a food desert, but we also, we are in food apartheid. And so as I work to become a farmer and to do more of um, growing my own food, I have come across a lot of issues um, with being able to grow, getting land access, and being able to actually provide some of that produce is based upon my skin color and my ability to do that compared to people who are white um, or also have more money um, or sometimes are men. That, that is some of the, the barriers to be able to do that. And so a lot of my students and their families who want to grow food or are interested in specifically they have that background, they just don't have the access to land. And it's a big barrier. And so all those things, you know, it, it stems from our, you know, our history of slavery and how people weren't really, um, weren't really able giving, to, weren't really given the option of how, what they can grow and what they can eat. Um, and there's one kind of, um, 
a kind of like a fact that's kind of like, I kind of remember the fact, so I'm gonna give it to you. What I remember is like, I think in the early 1900s, most of the farmers who uh, existed, you know, it was like 80% black. And 100 years later, less than 0.2% of them are black. Um, and so a lot of the things, the reason why that happened is because, you know, improper or racist way that people um, like give them loans or, um, Taking care, taking their land, or you know, burning the land and run people off from the places they have that was most sustainable. Um, currently, in my experience, I'm still dealing with that and really working to create an economic system that's based on abundance um, instead of discrimination and scarcity. And so, the idea of how we actually grow our food, um, the practices we use that are now um, starting climate change, that's based on white supremacist practices. And so the way that I grow and want to teach my students how to um, cultivate the land is in ways that kind of respect nature, that works with nature, instead of um, exploiting some of our natural resources. And that just comes from how we used to um, exploit black and brown bodies during slavery and force them to kind of exploit the earth. Any other answers to that question? I just want to follow up on what Lauren was talking about and thinking about the processes that um, undergird food access and food insecurity challenges and the ways in which they are embedded in systemic racism is really obvious when you look at the data itself and trying to understand who is experiencing these barriers to food access, that we can see that it impacts all bodies and all places, but that there is certainly a concentration in urban community of color, and that that is, as as Lauren suggested, you know, an outcome of the the many decades and century of racist practices around economic and land access, as well as the ways in which we fund or not fund resources across urban communities. And so I think that that's a really key piece, and I really also appreciate, Lauren, that you uplift the concept of food apartheid rather than food deserts. It's not about this naturally occurring lack of food, but it is a process of power and disinvestment that is very much entrenched in our social systems. And I think that that's an important part of thinking about it. One part is the, you know, creating processes or opportunities for folks to grow, but everybody needs to eat and everybody needs to eat every day. And how do we look at the system and find ways to really invest in communities so they have the economic stability to access the food that we all need and with dignity um, that I think is really important. I'm gonna add to that. Um, and just kind of by painting a picture of the food apartheid that happens here. Um, I live on Farmington Ave, and I choose to go to West Hartford for my uh, grocery shopping. And um, I think it's Corbin's Corner. And within Cor Corbin's Corner, there are three or four major grocery food chains, um, not even with, uh, in less than a mile radius of one another, I believe. So I can go to one, uh, I can go to Whole Foods and then like drive around the corner and there's a big Y. And then um, I forget the, the Crown Supermarket um, and I think there's another one. Um, now I grew up in Hartford all my life and uh, we've had Sea towns Bravo, smaller um, grocery chains. I believe about six years ago, we just got a Key Foods. I think it was like, you know, six years ago. Um, and then we have the Stop and Shop, which is on the border of uh, Hartford and West Hartford. Um, and these are all like on the south end of Hartford. We don't have any uh, large chain grocery stores in the north end at all. The north end is predominantly black. So, with that, I, I think there's just, I think that's violent. I think there's a war on uh, black people and brown people because of this. It's done intentionally. That wasn't an accident. So now you have people in these communities dealing with all types of health issues because we choose not to have a grocery store. 
Why is it taking more than 10 years to plan to have a, a national grocery store in uh, the North End? I, I don't know why um, that's happening, right? Well, sorry, I do know why that's happening. <laughs> Um, so I would just ask that question and really push it. It's, it, it doesn't take uh, politics to understand that you, we need to feed people and we need to, we need to feed people good food. That's it. So there's a, there's a blatant and obvious uh, discrimination, racism happening here in Hartford. And I encourage you to explore that and drive around and check it out. Um, just to add one piece to what Jocelyn said, I did a little bit of research and I did learn that the highest population of black homeowners in Hartford is in the North End. And so it, there are people who have resources and are sustainable. And I wonder if, you know, I'm not wonder, I know that community is being punished because it can't be actually gentrified in the way that previous um, areas of black communities um, have in the past because they don't actually own the land. And so the fact that a lot of black people own the land and have a little bit more power in that area, um, I've noticed that there's more, um, there's more effects of apartheid um, happening and happening. And, and it's kind of, it's not a coincidence. Um, also, if you guys take a moment to go outside, you know, take a, look, take a look at the trees and how they look and compare that to other parts of Hartford or even West Hartford. Um, the trees are the things that help clean and prepare our soil and our water to be able to actually grow. And so there's a big difference to the quality. Um, and it's, it's, not, it's not by accident. And to add on to that, it's not only just the um, locations of these uh, stores that we need, but the produce in general, the ingredients that are going into build, growing these plants and actually um, producing these uh, foods that we eat. So it's like we have, if you walk into all of these, most of the time you had to walk to the back aisle. You would have to go, I had to go to five different stores just to find a uh, certain uh, produce. Like I had to go to all these just to get spinach or I had to go to Whole Foods just to get um, berries from over here. And I had to go to Trader Joe's just to get my milk. You know what I'm saying? And all these trips is taking $20 a dollar twenty-five, seventy-five, just on gas or just on the bus alone, and it's taking up all, all my day. So I don't even have time. I only have time to go to grocery shop and to go to work. And after that, I don't even have time to cook like that. So now I'm buying snacks from the stores that have all type of soy, all type of ingredients that I can't understand. I challenge y'all to go to the store and actually look at the snacks that y'all feeding your child. We, 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 <laughs> we don't have enough time to really understand. We scrambling around and we. Um, we're looking for things to uh, feed our soul, but actually looking to the ingredients that's you giving, that you're eating, that you're also giving your children, you giving to them to go to school. We sit here and, and blame these children and send them to insane asylums. You know what I'm saying? When they really need a hug and some real food, some home cooking food, you know what I'm saying? And somebody to talk to. But there's nobody there to even talk to because mom got to go to work, you got to go to the grocery store. We go to the grocery store with you is don't touch that. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? But you're not picking up no fruit. You're not telling them what to touch. You know what I'm saying? So that's just an idea. And I just one small other comment. Um, just want to acknowledge the school, like the prison pipeline. Um, that is really significant because students, when they don't have proper nutrition, don't have proper food, their behavior, it's harder for them to control. And so you have black and brown students who don't have proper nutrition, who are hungry, who don't deserve that. And then you have police and people in the school who are, who are um, judging them based upon white supremacist values and saying that they, and putting them kind of in jail when if they were fed properly and if their families were fed properly, they actually wouldn't be exhibiting those behaviors and they wouldn't, um, they wouldn't feel like that they didn't have the resources that they need. And so doing that is also, in, a, in my opinion, but also probably the truth, it's creating more slaves um, to be able to go to prison and work for free in the agricultural systems um, that exist now. A lot of prisoners are actually working in the field, similar to how slaves were doing it. I mean, they're still slaves. Whew. Let's take a minute, y'all. Wow. This, is, this is a lot of information to take in, right? 
Okay, so there's a lot of emotions involved, right? So um, I'm just curious, how has your own emotional connection to food security influenced the way you approach advocacy, support for affected communities, right? Because I, I remember when I've, I've, for each of you, have done a little bit of work, different capacity of like advocacy and lobbying and just looking at different bills. Like, so thinking of that, how has that like impacted the way you approach advocacy work? Well, I just wanna take this moment to identify and uplift that a lot of our advocacy colleagues in school food are at the LOB down the street right now, um, testifying or getting ready to testify to increase funding for school breakfast and free school lunches um, as we speak. And so trying to think about the, the work that you know, many, many members across the state are, are putting in because we are so passionate and invested in children's well-being and thinking about the long run, the, the lifetime impact that food insecurity has over the life course um, begins so early. And one area that can address this is by meaningfully supporting school food, among many other initiatives um, to address family and childhood food insecurity. And so I'm just in, in my mind and heart thinking about my colleagues that are at the LOB right now, who've been there all day <laughs> and waiting to testify for that support. I don't remember the bill number, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So um, with me, it started with uh, my personal experience. Um, so I ended up being uh, diagnosed with Crohn's when I was uh, 20 years old, and it uh, just hit me by surprise. Like one day I woke up, I didn't feel good. I went to the hospital and realized that um, I couldn't leave. Um, they said that, um, you know, I needed surgery, you know, um, and I was there for about a month. And I think that's, that physically really changed my life, right? Um, but even spiritually, it, it made me realize um, a few things. Um, no one in my family uh, has Crohn's disease. It was random. Um, and the more I learned about my body um, and just how the body functions in general, I just realized because I grew up in a very just stressful environment and didn't have the proper uh, food, the nutrition, um, that that's what impacted my health uh, in the long run. Um, and the more I learned about uh, food access and food insecurity, I learned that I'm not the only one with this story. Um, I went to high school with kids that all have some type of uh, issue. Um, and that makes me angry as hmm. It makes me angry because it did not have to be like this. Had we had access to proper nutrition, um, had my mom had access to food, um, I think, you know, my situation could have uh, ended up being a little different. Um, so because of, of this experience, I kind of just look at um, things a little differently. Um, and it's just asking the question, when, in terms of advocacy, it's just asking the question, like, what do people really need? Like, you can read about it, you can study it. Um, but what about the people that really lived it? There's a lot of folks out there that are living this right now that are experts, you know, and we don't give them, you know, the platform, maybe because they don't speak English, maybe because they're not a U.S. citizen, maybe they don't have a degree, anything like that, right? Um, but when it comes to my advocacy work, my goal is to, you know, give a platform or somehow create a way for folks um, who have this lived experience to, to share their stories and share their knowledge. And I think that's super valuable. Um, I guess also too, when you said advocacy, I was like, wait, I'm doing that? 
just forming. Um, and also, like, I guess I would say I feel very blessed. I grew up in, like, an all-white neighborhood, and I had um, some really awesome family. Shout out to Irving and Dorinda and to my brother Malcolm. Um, also because, like, I had really good nutrition growing up, and, like, my, I remember my grandfather would send up, like, sardines and walnuts that were like, why do we have all this food? And it was good, and I feel blessed. And when I came to Hartford and saw how, what they were feeding these children, I was mad. I was like, what is this? This is unacceptable. No. And so I have to agree with Jocelyn and say I'm pretty salty. It's unacceptable, to be honest. Um, and people deserve to get proper food, and I do this because I really love nature, and I really love being outside and seeing that students don't have the ability to make that connection for whatever reason is not just not okay. And I, um, I've, I've, it's really important for me to share that wealth and that knowledge because the work that I do, the feeling I get is joy to be able to share that. Um, and I don't want that joy to be overshadowed by rage um, in, in the idea that people aren't getting what they deserve. Um, for example, 100 years ago, Hartford planted all these medicinal trees, fruit trees, ginkgo, all these different things to really support the community to be able to have an abundance of food. And that's not being properly cared and cultivated because of whatever, um, whatever kind of racist policies are put in place to disenfranchise people. And so that, should, that makes me mad and that should make everyone mad because it doesn't just affect people in Hartford, it affects us all because we're wasting the food and the way that climate change is gonna yoink us out of our current situation of comfort is gonna be very jarring. And so it's better for us to have these local food systems and an awareness that um, we need to all be angry in order for change and to be honest, so we don't starve. And just to add on to that, it's not just planting trees because I mean, they're not being properly taken care of. We have uh, cars driving past and all those plants is breathing in on that exhaust. So even if you try to eat those plants, it'll make you sick. So it's the culture that we, how to, how to I, take your bite to work. <laughs> Why do we have roads? We can have dirt roads. We don't have to have um, rubber soles on, our, on the bottom of our feet disconnecting us from the energy of the earth. It's a culture, it's a whole mindset that goes behind it. So you can't just expect them, you can't expect us to just throw, you can't expect to just throw trees and plants out in the, um, on the side of the road and think that you're doing something. I appreciate the effort, but I actually try to talk to the people and actually, uh, I wouldn't say assimilate to the culture, but actually learn about the culture and know what it is exactly. Know how to be it, breathe it, feel it, and eat it, you know. Like, actually, <clears throat> yeah, actually just to be a part of it, you know, and, uh, instead of, like, looking out uh, from out, outside of the box, you know. So, yeah. Uh, I don't even think I answered the question, but, yeah. <laughs> We're getting ready to open up questions to the audience, but before we do that, think of your questions as they speak. I have one last question for the panelists. Uh, doing this work couldn't be a lot, and it brings out a lot of emotions, and we talk about a lot of the things that can be hard, right? But I'm curious, what brings you joy in this journey? What makes you wake up every day and want to continue to do this work? Everything. <laughs> Everything about it, just being able to see the sunshine. I got plants in my windows, you know, so every time I look up in my windows, I'm like, yeah, my baby, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I go plant some water. It's just um, actually being able to see these kids learning and actually learn something about their body. Like, be like, yo, this is a, we, we, we call these plants around us weeds all day. That's a weed, that's a weed, that's a weed. But these are actually herbs that could help to, if we got a scrape or a burn on our, on, our, on, our, on our arm or our leg, you could just teach the kid, yo, chew this up real quick and put it on your, and they'll be like, yo, what? I didn't even know I could do this. I've been suffering all this long, you know? Stuff like this brings me joy, you know, just being able to eat fresh fruit from the ground, being able to smile with my people, and all people, everywhere, <laughs> my people. It's like, um, what else greater joy can you really have? You know, there's pain in putting seed into the soil and, 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 and trying to grab blueberries from, and pricking yourself on a thorn, but would it really be uh, harvesting and actually, would it actually be fun if you didn't, you know? Would it actually be... Uh, joyful if you didn't know the pains of actually toiling the soil. 
actually getting those uh, blisters on your hand from holding the land all day, you know, like <laughs> you wouldn't really understand how joyful it is unless until you do it. That's what I mean by getting into the culture. Don't just sit around and give them money and, and carry a, a box over there real quick and then take some pictures and leave. Plant some soil and stay there. Watch it grow and talk to the kids while it grows. Water it every single day. Give them money too. <laughs> they like that. Shower it on them. It's respect, you know. In, in certain cultures, learn culture. Learn yourself first and foremost. That's what brings you joy for real, for real. Because if you don't know yourself, how can you actually find joy in anything that you do? Everything will be hell for you if you don't know yourself. Peace. I'm a dreamer, um, and uh, what brings me joy in this work is just dreaming up the the possibility of what our future or um, our youth's future. What the that really what does that really look like? Um, and it's it's really just the the possibility um, that brings me joy. And also the idea, um, so I'm opening up a, uh, a grocery store in Hartford. And thank you. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, can I get some energy for that? Yeah, we up here doing, we doing big things. Can I get some energy real quick? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you. <laughs> love, love. Um, thank you. And uh, what brings me joy around that is just uh, the fact that we'll be working with local farmers, uh, black, indigenous, and farmers of color specifically to bring local healthy food to uh, the Hartford community um, and to make it really accessible. And just planning that and dreaming it and, and dreaming of our futures, that really just keeps me hopeful and keeps me running, right? So I think that's it. That was awesome. <laughs> um, I would say I definitely have joy. And when I'm working with students or their families, there's always a moment when people are like, huh, what? And their eyes gloss over and they're really into it. I love that part. When, um, as I'm helping people, people develop a personal relationship with nature, they, they're able to figure out how it connects with them. Um, there was a little girl who like did not believe me that carrots came from the ground and when it fully grew she picked it up the carrot was like this big and she was like miss I have the carrot and I was like boom that's you right there she's gonna remember that and love farming and my thing is I really want to create those relationships because if you think about how our economic system is it's all about a system of relationships and trade and so I want to develop a new system of relationships that allows for us to be sustainable and I'm also going to shout out that I'm starting an, um, I'm opening an, an urban farm and an outdoor education center on, in the north end on Clark Street. I'm so excited yes, like because that. one, I want to be able to show my students that it can be possible to be done in Hartford. Also to be a local producer for the schools that I serve and work with and hopefully working with Jocelyn. But then also to provide opportunities for other people who are living in the area to do that. There are a lot of people in Hartford who have very good farming skills, but not the land and the access to do that. Um, and so my goal is to create this system of economic support that is based upon abundance and community connections. Um, and so I just get joy. Also, I love snacks and eating food, so that's great. Um, and it's really important because it's also something that I have to really Shout out to all my students. They have said that this is what they want. This is what they need. Um, I've asked them. I've asked their parents. This is what is required. And so it really brings me joy to not only develop those relationships, but to be outside and to really develop relationships with the trees and the animals and the insects and to kind of um, to address some of the white supremacy that happens in landscaping and agriculture. And once we're able to kind of work to address that, I've, I really feel like the way that we address it, we're going to begin to address some of our institutional racism and use that same process and model. Because if we were able to explore agriculture and make our current economic system, we can do it again, but not in a way that sucks, um, <laughs> to be honest. And that's hurtful. And so, yeah, I'm also hoping that by the end of today, everyone can also experience that joy and really work to support us um, to make the change. And so, as I develop these relationships, um, you know, I'll get, 
shouting out to all the audience that we can also work together and develop relationships to support each other, share resources, knowledge, information, and opportunities um, to make a change. I would just say all of this. This is what brings me joy. This is what inspires me. I think as I identify as a researcher, educator, advocate, just knowing all of this amazing work is happening and sharing that with students who are a little bit older than the K through 12 scene, but you know, seeing 19, 20 year olds come in and say, wait, change is really possible. We don't have to just live with this as if it was a fate predestined for us that we can't do anything about. Um, I know it's possible. I know it's hard, long work, um, but there are so many amazing, inspiring people doing this work. And the more that we share that and uplift that through platforms like this and, and elsewhere, that the more people will come and join that fight. And I think that it can be one that is both challenging and joyful at the same time. And, and that it is food, that food is this place to build relationships and find connection and joy while we work for a broader social and environmental justice. It's such a, a wonderful space to be in. And I think it continues to feed me as well. Perfect. Can we clap it up for them real quick? <laughs> Now we would like to hear from you. I know as you listen to our amazing panelists speak, there's a lot of thoughts and questions and comments that come up for you. So uh, Lucy will be walking around. She has the mic. So if you have a question, if you could just raise your hand to comment, uh, and Lucy will walk around and give you a chance to, to address the panelists. First, I want to give you guys a shout out and thank you for all of this amazing work and being here and sharing with us tonight. Um, so I work on food security in New Haven and the lower Naugatuck Valley. And <clears throat> I learned in the fall that the state had created a new position called a state food systems coordinator that they were recruiting for, which I almost thought about applying for and then I came to my senses. But um, <laughs> no, I, I say that because I really believe um, the work that we are doing in our communities is so important. And I was just wondering if you knew about this, but even if you didn't, um, what would be something that you would imagine asking for as like a priority? Like, here's the thing that we can really use your help on. Um, we need money. <laughs> and like, I'm farming all the time, 12 hours a day. I need, we need help writing grants and organizing and organizing a way of letting people know what we're doing, marketing. Farmers, we are so tired. And it's one of the most dangerous jobs in the whole world. We don't have health care. Um, and we are producing a lot of the food, but not getting a lot of the coin to go with it. And so we need people to speak up on our behalf, especially white people. Um, and people who don't look like me to, to be able to say that this work is valuable, to make those connections. Um, just want to give a shout out to someone here that I met. She was very helpful and supportive in saying these are some resources and connections. Keep doing that. Keep telling us what's happening. Even you kind of sharing some of the details of information that we don't know. Really sharing the information because I know um, in the past there are like um, there's knowledge and certain gatekeeps information that are in some white communities for people who are farming that we have no idea about. And so we just want every y'all to start sharing, share the wealth and the resources, um, and also make it easier for us to fill out applications for money um, or finding different ways to assess and collect data. Um, the way that we're required to report things, it's in a way that's, I'm gonna say it again, based on white supremacy and based on a way that data should be collected in, um, in a method that people who aren't doing the work that we're doing or understand it feel it needs to be done that way. Let's just find a different way. Also, I'm going to say it again, money, 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 money. Uh, I would add um, just advocating more around um, food security and just getting really loud about it. Um, we need more voices. We need um, 
you know, more initiatives out there, um, you know, just talking about this. Um, I don't think we talk about food enough. Um, and I want to see that happen. I just want to echo that in thinking about who we listen to and, you know, we're, we're all here because we have been selected by Cheyenne, of course, and, and we work in this field, but everybody is an expert in their community about how they can or cannot get food and thinking about what voices get lifted up and what voices get silenced is really important and thinking about having somebody in a formal role for addressing food systems for the government and trying to understand how you get access to community members with their lived experience and actual expertise of the challenges that they face, that we don't do that enough and trying to understand that, that those stories are data, that, that that is what we should be looking at and trying to use that to develop our interventions and build resources around. Um, I just have one quick thing. Also, we really need to address the nonprofit, um, the nonprofit industrial complex because that's a lot of the reason why we don't have the resources we need. Not going to say any names, but if you ask me off camera, I'll tell you um, there are a lot of nonprofits that I've interacted with, and very few, oh, not a lot of them that aren't really working to address some of the issues, but are also hoarding the resources for themselves. And that hurts us because they are the ones controlling the narrative, saying who gets what, what's important, and sharing that data with the funders who just continues that. And so more financial accountability and more financial transparency is needed. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? We have one back there. Thank you all, this is really wonderful. I'm wondering if any of you have thoughts on how to draw in folks who don't identify themselves or their communities as being food insecure and help them um, become engaged with and care about this issue. Um climate change, because we're all going to be food insecure very soon. Um, and also just giving, sharing, giving away snacks, seeds, um, and really helping people to understand that. If we don't do this, we're all going to be hungry. Um, but also really showing people and sharing some of your harvest and having them taste how good it is, organic food is, compared to some of the other things they're getting in the grocery store. I went to the grocery store the other day, and Michael Green's was $6. I've never seen that. That's unacceptable. So I know everyone's prices are increasing. And so starting with that, I think it's a great way to get people engaged. I just, I just want to add that I, I think that people who are struggling with food and economic stability know that they are struggling with food and ec economic stability. And I, I think it's really about understanding that there are already so many barriers and challenges around time that folks face and having the sense of being included in that conversation and that it really is incumbent upon folks who have the capacity and the you know sort of political power to make a deliberate effort to reach out to folks to hear their voice. And I, I think that that is one of the challenges is that we can't expect people to nominate themselves to come forward with all of the other responsibilities they have in their everyday life, working sometimes two or more jobs just to make ends meet, raising children, you know, struggling with the challenges of everyday life in an inequitable system that, that they're going to also come forward and speak up about what their needs are. That there's just so many challenges around that and it's incumbent upon our elected officials and other leaders to really seek people out and provide the resources and support to hear them. And I mean resources like money and resources like time and platforms to do that. We have another question. Hi, um, this is all wonderful information. I was curious to know your thoughts on, um, you know, that balance of, uh, I'm looking at this through a food uh, pantry perspective and, you know, always trying to think about what are people asking for? What do people want to eat, right? And making sure we're, we're giving people access to what they want. 
Um, but then there's also the school of thought around, but also what should, you know, maybe should people be eating, right? Like what's more nutritious, right? Like um, we have um, some farmers in our community that just want to keep giving us more and more kale because they feel like that's what people should be eating. So I guess I'm curious to know where you stand on, you know, your balance between what people want versus what's nutritious and how far do you... Um, you know, provide education to someone around different options for food versus let's just provide people what they're asking for, what they know, what they want. I think there could be a balance, um, just acknowledging that, um, you know, we are, you know, in Connecticut um, and depending on uh, the demographic you serve, but I just think of all the local farmers uh, that I know that grow culturally relevant foods and that um, I believe work with Food Share and Hartford Public Food Systems to provide uh, that food. And it may be looking for farmers that already uh, are growing, uh, say, like collards or callaloo, again, de depending on the demographic that you're serving. Um, and I think, and I'm not sure if I'm, you know, missing the mark uh, with this question, but um, I think a lot of culturally relevant foods are um, healthy foods, and it's just maybe asking people, like, that question, like, what, what do they eat back home? How do you prepare it? What's similar? Um, and just go from there, just uh, really having those conversations with people and seeking um, farmers from those cultures. Um, I think that would be a way to uh, support that. Yes. Um, one thing I think about is food preference surveys. Um, to, and also the choice of like speci uh, different species of the same thing. Um, but then also like healthy soil, just make sure that your soil is good and you're really focusing on soil nutrition to make sure you have things that are nutrient dense. Um, I'm also a little, I think I'm a little confused with the question because trying to understand how, yeah, I think I would just would like to learn more about how different things are chosen because I feel like there's maybe a lack of understanding with um, some of the schools or some farmers of like why it's, why certain foods are being chosen. Because I feel like farmers, if they get the feedback of we need this amount of nutrients or we need this, they can make adjustments. Um, and so that's something we're still figuring out what, um, like what is the best food to grow. And so it's just collecting of data and developing those um, relationships over time. One more question. Hi, oh, sorry. Um, first of all, I just wanna say thank you so much for being here. Um, and I learned a lot tonight, so thank you very much. Um, I recently moved to Connecticut from Arizona, which has all different kinds of insecurities, mostly around water, um, which we haven't had a difficulty with lately, especially around here. But um, I wanted to just uh, make sure that we, I especially got um, the names of all your organizations, just because I didn't write them down when you guys were introducing yourselves. And I wanna make sure that I remain active and engaged with you all. So I'm hoping that maybe you can just reiterate like the names of your organizations and how we can get in contact with you. What's the best way to keep up with what you're doing? Because I just think it's beautiful and I'm really proud of all of you. And that's it. All right, we'll start next to so, me to my <laughs> Sorry, I was just about to say thank you. Um, but uh, to answer your question, yeah, my name, my brand name is uh, Green Legum. You can find, follow me on Instagram um, and Facebook at Legume Green. That's L-E-G-U-M-E-G-R-E-E-N. So, yeah. Uh, my organization is called Mercado Popular. Uh, you can find us on Instagram at Mercado Pop CT or Mercado Pop dot shop. Um, also, I uh, want to say my company's name is Lauren Little Edutainment LLC, and the stage that you see on your table is for me. It's locally grown, organic, and awesome. Um, and you can find me on Instagram at Miss Lauren Little. Um, you can also follow my website. And then uh, outside at the table, I have just like little knickknacks you guys can take. I have a sign up sheet and I have a QR code where you can kind of connect with me. Um, please visit me on Instagram and visit my website. Um, and I would love to connect with anyone who's interested today.
Um, I'm at Wesleyan University at the College of the Environment, and you can find me there on the website, but I also want to encourage folks to follow us at the Connecticut Farm to School Collaborative, where we're deeply involved with a lot of these important issues through the school lens. And we can also send out the names and the links to each organization to attendees who are here tonight. I think we have time for one more question before I turn it back to Shine. Actually, I wanted to ask a question. So in urban farming, to in order to usually in farm to improve the soil, you have animals. And so are you, in order to improve your soil, I don't think, that, does the city allow you to have animals like, you know, pigs and chickens and things like that that will improve your soil? Or are you just using compost? Or how do you do that? That's a great question. There's some ways that I do it that um, the city approves of and ways that they're not going to know about. Um, <laughs> so a one thing that I do is I partner with Trinity College to do a composting program that starts at the community gardens and repurposing, you know, scraps to make new soil. I um, also believe in um, using cover crops as a way of soil remediation. I'm also going to be doing some hooger culture uh, garden beds, raised garden beds. The best way to improve the soil is to understand it and to work with it um, and to give it time. And so Hartford is full of lead because of, um, again, I'm going to say racisms. Um, and so during urban farming, you have to really always be feeding the soil using really good amendments. Um, and just being aware of the animals. You are allowed to have about six chickens, but you have to go through a rigorous process sometimes, especially with planning and zoning, which is another reason why it's so difficult to have land and access. Um, something I do, I just work with the other farmers, and we share soil, we share amendments, um, and we are, it's really important for us to have that relationship in order to fix the soil. Um, even at my farm, it has a bunch of lead in it, so I'll be working to remediate that over a period of time and sharing the knowledge that I gained to make sure it's easier for farmers in the future. All right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you to our amazing panelists for this conversation tonight. And thank you to all of you for being present with us. So. I hear people already asking questions, how they can stay connected, how they can learn more. Um, we have tables outside with Connecticut Public's information, Connecticut Black and Brown Student Union, and um, Lauren also have items outside. So there are many ways in which we can continue to be engaged. And Lucy, we will also work on sending out information following this conversation if you signed up and registered for this event where we'll share more. So, this conversation is very critical, and it's, it's, I hope it doesn't just end here tonight. And as um, Dr. Christine said, we have, this issue is very particular and personal to Connecticut and to our community right now as we speak. Um, we have an article that was released this, this past week that shows our schools are now returning to paid lunches, paid, paid meals, and um, Throughout the 50 district in Connecticut alone, we are in over $366,000 in debt um, already, right? So I understand a lot of you might not be in school anymore, but you might have families, uh, uh, members, friends, colleagues that are in our school systems. And that's an issue particularly when we think about our schools and the future of this country, which always goes back to our young people and our students and our education system. Uh, so if you're wondering what is something you can do, that is something to look into because our, our students, our community are being strongly impacted by this issue. When I say $366,000, y'all, over $366,000, our school in debt. And that is probably most likely someone you've passed by, interacted with today. So as we continue to have this conversation, we hope that in April 25th, you all could join us in the next, the continuous of this conversation, which will be focused on housing. Thank you. Thank you, thank you.